Welcome, everyone. And thank you so much for coming. I'm Katie Gotch, and I'm the Coordinator of Public Affairs for the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. And I welcome you to our first public engagement event, Understanding Sexual Abuse and Sexual Assault, Causes, Consequences, and Prevention. As you can imagine, some of the topics we'll be discussing today may be a little sensitive, and we do have some individual, well, an individual on site who is available if anyone needs assistance. Angela, would you mind standing? Angela is a doctoral student um, who is also in a victim advocacy role, so she's available if anyone needs some assistance with that. Just some general housekeeping issues. Restrooms are outside right down the hall. We will not be taking any official breaks. We're just going to kind of flow through the event from speaker to speaker. But there will be the question and answer sessions that will allow people to have some breaks throughout. So we have four different topics with eight wonderful speakers here today. We have a number of resources and materials in the back for you to take. And um, just a few other housekeeping issues. The question and answer sessions, there will be one speaker who will speak for about 10 minutes. The second speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. And then we'll have 10 minutes allocated for question and answer. If you have a question um, that you would like to bring up, there are pads of paper and pens at the front um, on all of the tables. Please write down your question and submit it to either myself or my co-organizer, Karen McCartan, who I believe is out. <laughs> I'll introduce him when he comes in. He's uh, just making sure anyone who is interested in coming to the event is currently here. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Oh yes, you might notice that we have a number of cameras in the room. So in addition to recording this for educational purposes, we also have a documentary film crew here. So if you do not want to be filmed, please try and sit behind the cameras um, or notify the staff that you are not interested in being filmed. And I think without further ado, we will get things started with sexual abuse as a public health issue. And Elizabeth Letourneau will be getting us started. Welcome to our public engagement event. ATSA is absolutely delighted that you are joining with us to discuss the prevention of sexual assault. Um, my name is Elizabeth Letourneau, and I am the president of ATSA. And I am also the director of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. ATSA's mission is the prevention of sexual assault. And I think we all agree that prevention is the goal. However, in terms of where most of us put our resources, and certainly in terms of where we as a nation put our resources, um, it's much more after the fact. Uh, we focus on criminal justice solutions, and we focus on treating victims. And those will always be critical components of a response to sexual assault, but they are insufficient. And they also wait for people to get harmed we absolutely must begin to consider how we can address sexual assault before it occurs. We need far more resources um, and just far more thinking about how do we interrupt this from occurring in the first place. Um, I think part of the problem is that many of us tend to think of sex offenders as unpredictable, unstoppable monsters. Uh, and consequently, their actions cannot be prevented. Uh, certainly, we know that it, in the media, that's often the way that this is portrayed. And it's how many of us have really been conditioned to think about sex crimes, that this is something that's committed by someone who's very different from us. Um, and we don't really seem to be able to see prevention. Um, and so I've been. Uh, giving a lot of thought to how to make prevention real as a goal. Um, where I'm at at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, prevention underlies everything that we do. 
And so that is where the child car seat was invented. That is where um, the use of surgical gloves was pioneered. And that is where all three strains of polio were identified and polio best practices uh, were developed. So prevention can look like a car seat. It can look like a pair of gloves. It can look like a vaccine. And I think to, um, to most of us, these sound simple and obvious. But none of those prevention interventions were simple or obvious when they were first discovered. And they actually faced opposition. Um, my youngest sibling is 23 years younger than me. So I grew up without car seats, as did my brothers. But my youngest sister grew up with car seats. She's only 25 right now. My mom hated car seats. <laughs> she, she absolutely hated them. And it was a real struggle for her to, uh, to use them all the time. She eventually did. But it's just an example of how something that everyone in this room, you, you would not think twice about using a car seat. In fact, you would think twice about ever letting a young child or a baby ride in a car without a car seat. It's, 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 oop, it's practically part of our DNA. Um, but there was a struggle to get there. There was a struggle to get surgeons to wear gloves. None of you would let a surgeon operate on you without gloves or operate on someone that you love. And there was a struggle, um, and there, for some people, continues to be a struggle, but most of us would never risk the crippling effects of polio um, instead of getting vaccinated or getting our children vaccinated. None of those problems has been eradicated. We still have a car injury and deaths. We still have um, hospital and surgery-related infections. And we still have polio. But we have made enormous progress in each of those areas, uh, indispu indisputably enormous progress in each of those areas. And I really believe we can get there with the prevention of sexual assault as well, if we can all come to agree that each of us is part of the solution, each of us is a preventionist, um, and see what that means. And so I'm going to give you an example of what I think prevention might look like um, in the field of sexual assault. My particular area of expertise um, now is with child sexual assault and the prevention of child sexual assault. And I think one day we may get to a point where effective prevention interventions of child sexual assault look as simple and as obvious as a car seat. More than half of child sexual abuse cases are actually perpetrated by other children, by people who are younger than 18 years of age. And some of those boys and a few girls do that because they're sexually attracted to children. But most of them do it for other reasons. Um, they are hanging out with delinquent peers. They have access to children and are not monitored for long stretches of time. They are impulsive. They lack knowledge about what is OK and what is not OK and with whom. And so I think, truly, prevention of child sexual abuse in particular may one day look as simple as teaching our boys, our 12 and our 13 and our 14-year-old boys, to not touch the penises of six-year-olds. And that sounds very simple and obvious, but it is absolutely not being done. We do not teach our children these rules in a way that is overt and that makes sense and that is replicable. And that is one of the places where we need to put some energy. If we want to prevent sexual abuse, we need to look at who's most likely to perpetrate sexual abuse. And 12 and, 14, 12 and 13 and 14-year-old boys are one of those groups. Another group that is, uh, has the potential for committing child sexual abuse in particular are the boys who are, in fact, sexually attracted to children. There are not very many of those boys, but they desperately need our help. And we do not help them. ATSA has a collaborative project ongoing right now to try to develop an intervention to treat um, boys and the few girls who are sexually attracted to children most of these boys understand that they would harm a child if they acted out on those, um, those attractions, and they don't want to. Um, so it's a matter of giving them the tools and resources and skills and support to continue to not acting out, to give those tools and resources to their parents, but also to help them develop into healthy, um, well-supported young adults who are achieving their own great potential. 
that's just a couple of examples, and they're very different. One is a universal intervention for boys um, and other kids to avoid abusing children for reasons due to impulsivity or lack of knowledge or, or other, um, other effects. Um, and then the other is really targeted towards boys who are attracted to kids. But that's just two. There's many other ways I think we could develop prevention programs if we put our minds to it and we put our resources to it. Um, but we, we really don't. We, we do uh, a lot to try to intervene after the fact. And again, while that's important, it's absolutely insufficient. Sexual assault rates have been declining since the 1990s. And this is great news, and it means we're doing something right. We need to figure out what that is and package it. Um, I think there's a lot of different avenues for doing so, and that we need the resources for it. So my hope is that if there's one message that you take away from today's public engagement event, it's that sexual assault is not inevitable. It is preventable. Um, and it is something we should all be arguing for resources uh, to go towards. So thank you very much. I need one more hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's two. I'm Bob Geffner. I'm the president of the Institute on Violence, Abuse, and Trauma at Alliant International University here in San Diego, and also the president of the Family Violence and Sexual Assault Institute. And I'm going to follow up on what Elizabeth said, talking not only about prevention, but some of the key issues, and give you some data in the quick time we have. Uh, now, this is not lit up. Does that mean anything? No? OK. So one of the things we know from the Centers for Disease Control and the research that's been going on is the huge prevalence. Uh, throughout the lifetime, we know that nearly 4 in 10 women, men, girls, and boys either are actually sexually assaulted or sexually abused, or there's an attempt to do that during their lifetime. Uh, that's a huge number. Uh, we also know that in general communities, out of 80 homes, nearly 20 have intimate partner violence or abuse going on. And one of the questions is, why am I showing that? We're talking about sexual assault. And I'm going to come back and tell you. I'm going to keep you in suspense. Are you all in suspense? Three of you are in suspense. <laughs> the rest of you don't care. OK, be that way. Uh, one of the things to follow up is that over two-thirds, almost, of sexual assault, sexual abuse that are attempted or completed, as Elizabeth said, are people we know, acquaintances, family members, coaches, uh, ministers, etc. That's a huge number. Now, what makes things even more complicated, and why I put both those statistics up there earlier, was we also know that anywhere from 60 to 75% of couples where there are partners where there is intimate partner violence, there is also sexual assault, meaning marital rape, uh, huge numbers. And I put this particular uh, slide up here because here in San Diego we had a precedent uh, a couple years ago that changed the laws. One woman changed the laws in the state of California because uh, her ex-spouse who raped her, was convicted of rape, was then given visitation with no conditions uh, upon release of jail. And also, she was uh, told that she had to pay his fees. And so she protested. And now, in the state of California, you can't do that. You don't get custody if you raped uh, and cause those situations. But the connection between all these forms of uh, interpersonal violence is really big. So when we're talking about sexual assault, sexual abuse, we're actually talking about other things at the same time. This is a, a great uh, slide. I really like this one. It'd be really good if I remembered who I stole it from. Uh, because it has a lot of the statistics pointed out there. Nearly uh, half of all rapes are uh, not, uh, are even reported to anybody, no disclosure, I don't even mean authorities, to anybody. Uh, only 3% of rapists actually go to jail. And the percentage that are even prosecuted are low. So it's not like we have a, a really good system of stopping sexual assault. Campus rapes, which we are now, oh, good, this died. That la lasted a long time. 
Okay, so much for this idea. We'll go to this one. Plan B, a little smaller. Uh, we know that uh, right now campus assaults, sexual assaults, are really being uh, publicized a lot, and that's really a, a key uh, for what we're paying attention to. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of myths around sexual assault. Uh, when you actually look at the research, somebody who actually goes to the process of reporting to the police a sexual assault, the chances of it being false are only about one in 10, and that's maximum. Now, that doesn't mean that each case isn't that one in 10, but it also means that what people think, that it's half of them are false or fabricated, has never been the case. We also, as I just mentioned, uh, well, this one doesn't work. <laughs> I'm doing really well up here. Uh, does any of them work? Let's try this one. Not much. Uh, 31 of the states, the rapist can sue for custody of the kids or visitation. 31 out of 50. Uh, and you heard the last election where a physician who was running for office said a, a woman who is raped can't be pregnant. Uh, and 12, 000, or 32,000 women each year get pregnant from a rape. So the myths out there are really profound. This is an example of a client we worked with who was a victim of child sexual abuse and then later sexually assaulted and raped as an adult. And this gives you some of the dynamics of what we're talking about. This is uh, a drawing she did and it's called Shame. She felt so worthless, so uh, uh, helpless, no self-esteem that the light from the window was not even allowed to shine on her face. Uh, and that's the level we're talking about. And that explains why you don't get a lot of complaints, especially as soon as somebody complains or files a complaint, they're going to be the ones attacked. They're going to be put on trial, not necessarily the offender. Uh, and if you want any of these slides, if you give me your card, I'll send them to you, because I'm going through them sort of quickly. But we, there's a lot of reasons why people don't file complaints or report sexual assaults. And in our culture right now, and many others, the norm is actually not to report, whether you're on campus, in the public, or in the community. And that really makes things difficult uh, until we change that. Uh, I gave you some uh, steps here on prevention that came out of the Prevention Institute some years ago, uh, which is sort of just a summary. And the reason that I like this is if you look at what they're saying we really need to do from education to promotion of public safety, building partnerships, uh, and changing our policies, uh, that was from a theoretical standpoint. That's how we move toward prevention. But if we're really going to be serious about preventing sexual assault and sexual abuse, then we have to change our norms. We have to get to a spot where it's not acceptable in any community to have somebody sexually abused, and where the community re really gets together. Right now, we have the NFL getting lots of publicity for domestic violence, child abuse, and sexual assaults. Why is the NFL the only one we're targeting? In Mississippi, there's a federal judge who beat up and assaulted his wife. There's not been a call for him to be removed from the bench. And I'm sure in your own communities, you can also think of examples where things have happened. I mean, most people now know about the clergy abuse and the scandals throughout this country. But what you may not know is the original reports on these clergy abuse surfaced 25 and 30 years ago by women all over the country. And one of the things they found is not that people came to their support. People came to the support of the alleged rapist. And we still see that happening now. But now the evidence has started surfacing 25 years later that these weren't fabricated reports, and that we didn't even touch the tip of the iceberg in sexual assault. And we don't have to just focus on churches and religious organizations. We can focus on schools. We can focus on colleges. We can focus on athletic teams. Because we don't have a norm 
that has been internalized, like the seat belts, where we just don't do that anymore. Does that say two, or a five, or a 10? <laughs> two, OK. Wishful thinking on my part. And that's what we're talking about doing, creating a social justice public health movement, just like other things, to change the norms. And people say, you can't do that. Well, people said not too long ago, you can't talk about women's breasts on TV. They said, people aren't going to go through their garbage and sort it out. People said, you can't stop an addictive compulsive behavior like drinking. All those movements that are now part of our norms took less than 20 years to change. And now they're part of our norms. But what affects more of us, more of our family, our communities, than any of those combined is interpersonal violence and abuse. So if you're interested, we're actually doing that. We have a whole national partnership that we help coordinate. And you can see the mission and the vision to change the way this country deals with interpersonal violence. So we do change the norms, that we do look at prevention, and we follow some of the things that I mentioned. And I know in the minute I have left, you're going to all have that memorized. But you can see the key is prevention, educating the public, intervention, advocacy, changing our policies, victims' rights, and really a collaborative, interdisciplinary movement. And I'm glad we have some flyers back there. If you want to know more, talk to me afterwards. But that's what it's going to take, all of you and all of us working together so that over the next 15 or 20 years, which is likely my lifespan, that we see a change. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thanks, Elizabeth. So, um, hi, I'm Keir, and I helped co-organize this with Kira. At the beginning, we said that if you had any questions, that you would write them down on post-it notes, and I would, we would go around and collect them. Does any tables have any questions for either Elizabeth or Bob, based upon what they've said? OK, so the first question is, the need for more funding and resources directed at prevention has been made clear, but where could this funding come from? And are proposals being denied funding at the minute? Right, so the idea, the idea of trying to come up with um, new dollars for research is pretty much a non-starter at least in the United States right now. Um, uh, there's a, there's a cost-benefit approach to prevention. Um, each instance of child abuse and neglect, regardless of what kind of child abuse or neglect it was, is estimated to cost about $210,000 across the lifespan of that child, uh, from victim costs to increase risk for re-victimization to increase risk for perpetration of harm later down the line. Um, reduce educational outcomes, reduce employment outcomes, and so on. Um, so there is an economic argument that um, politicians of, on both sides of the aisle in the U United States acknowledge. Um, but uh, benefiting from prevention in the long term is a hard sell when, when we have people really focused on the short term. And, it, and it's also a hard sell because we have victims we can see, we have offenders we can see, there's very strong arguments for putting resources into services, obviously, and into criminal justice interventions. And you can't see prevention, which is one of my points. Um, and so that really um, makes it difficult to, uh, to, to get funding. Um, resources, uh, uh, proposals are being denied. There's not uh, an organization that is funding the prevention of sexual assault. The, the Center for Disease Control um, and prevention, the CDC in the United States is charged with funding prevention, and they certainly do to the extent that they are able. <coughs> but by and large, they are not given funds to prevent sexual abuse. They get funds to prevent other kinds of violence. We have um, effective physical abuse prevention programs 
We have effective anti-bullying prevention programs. These are effective in the sense that they've been tried um, and tested in randomized controlled trials and other um, rigorous evaluations. We have prevention for shaken baby syndrome. We have prevention for adolescent suicide. We have prevention um, efforts, successful prevention efforts in, in several areas of violence prevention, but we do not have it for sexual assault. Um, and so we do need those resources. We need um, the CDC or the NIH, someone to, to uh, take ownership of really driving the prevention science, but they can't do that without the resources from government um, and from other foundations and um, uh, non-governmental organizations. Thank you. Is there, well, I think we've got time for one more question of any other table. Oh, that's it. How do we change social norms around an experience that relies on secrets and silence to perpetrate? She gives me that one. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to take time but you start breaking the secret. That means people start talking about it. Uh, start talking about it to your neighbors, to your family members, to your kids. All this thrives in secrecy, uh, and that's where you get the shame from. When we start openly talking about it, even like now, but to friends and others about sexual assault, interpersonal violence, and how that causes significant trauma, and what we can do about it, it starts making it more of a norm to be able to disclose. And the other thing that Elizabeth said earlier, and there's some flyers back there by others, is what we call bystander intervention. It's our responsibility to do that, to look at intervening and saying something when we see it happening. Uh, the secrecy is what keeps it going. And, and that's really been a problem, like in campus rapes and sexual assault. So right now, the way we're changing part of it is lawsuits. As you may hear, you know, there's lawsuits against the clergy, the churches, now law schools against, lawsuits against universities. is forcing them to change their policies so that they don't cover it up and you, in fact, have to have procedures in effect. So those are all starts. As we change uh, the laws, you change attitudes, and you start in the early grades. We start at the elementary school and preschool, and that's how norms change. That's sort of a simple answer for a complex problem. And I, you know, I would just add that what we've been doing for the last 25 years is, is working. So we have um, about a 50 or 60 percent reduction in the rates of sexual assault since 1990. And we should all be um, rejoicing about that reduction. To continue that, that decline, we need to bring something new to the table. And I think that new thing is really going to be a focus on prevention. But in addition to declining sexual assault rates, we have had increasing reporting rates. And so I think reporting laws, mandatory reporting laws are part of that. I think feminist movements that brought rape out of the shadows and quickly on the heels of that brought um, sexual assault of children out of the shadows um, is part of that. I think the criminal justice solutions that we uh, developed years ago is also part of that. Um, so there is good news to be heralded, um, but certainly far too many uh, sexual assaults go unreported, um, and we could do a better job of that. But it is important to, to, for you to know the wins. We, we have had declining rates of abuse and increasing rates of reporting. Um, and, and this is good news, and we need to keep doing um, more of what we're doing. I think we need to better understand what it is that we do that works. Thank you. So um, thank you, Bob, and thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Um, we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. So up next, we're going to move on to the next session, which is about understanding sexual offences. So, up first, we have David Prescott, and then following David, we have James Cantor. Good evening, everybody. It's really nice to be here, and uh, it's really great to see some familiar faces. I should say right at the outset that I'm going to say very few things that are actually original, and that many of the people with whom I collaborate 
the most fondly are, are actually in this room. So I'll try to give credit where credit is due, but I think our field is as strong as it is because we all come together uh, to collaborate, and uh, more on that as we go through. The other first thing I want to say is welcome to anybody that might be new to the field. Uh, I'm fond of saying that uh, every one of my gray hairs uh, came from uh, some sort of an evaluation or treatment experience that I did. I've been doing this for 30 years now, and um, I uh, came into the field. It's always so fascinating to find out how people come to do this kind of work and how once we are in, I'm not convinced that any of us ever really leave. Uh, we take the work really seriously, the work has value, and uh, I think retiring from our field can be uh, something, of, uh, something of a challenge. My story is actually really boring and I needed a job, and I took a job where I would work with people who had experienced sexual violence, and it seemed like the right thing to do, but over time, it, uh, it, it got really frustrating dealing with people who had been hurt. And sooner or later, there's a temptation to go upstream from this experience and to try to prevent uh, sexual crimes by working with the people who have actually caused sexual harm. So if we don't do a lot of research and treatment to figure out who are these people that are causing this harm, then I don't see how we can ever really truly say that we're preventing sexual violence. However, it can be a little bit like encountering this northern main street gang, that uh, you're walking along the road of life, and the next thing you know, you uh, are uh, encountering these bears. And you ask yourself things like, are they mad? Are they bad? Are they mentally ill? Are they uh, personality disordered? And sometimes the answer is all of the above, and sometimes it's none of the above. And uh, that is the uh, endless fascination of this work. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, this is just a, a photograph uh, from the, uh, the women's movement of the 1960s. I was born in 1960. I think my mother might be in this photograph. Um, she, uh, she certainly tried to, to raise me right. And for the first time, even though there's references to sexual crimes in the Bible and in the traditions of uh, various indigenous cultures, it seems to me it was the first time that the problem of sexual abuse actually made it onto the, the main stage of national dialogue. And uh, for the first time, people, uh, talk show hosts and celebrities, were talking about their own experiences of victimization. And uh, I know that uh, in the mid-1970s, there was a book that actually argued that in, uh, in an age where we have all sort of male-dominated patriarchal society, there could be no such thing as truly consensual sex. I thought that was taking it maybe a little bit far, but uh, I do take the point that there's a lot of dynamics involved in abuse that we should be, uh, that we should be studying. So also, as others have already mentioned, what do we know about human beings? People who've been hurt come together and talk about what's bothering them. We all join up. We all connect at the places where we've been hurt or wounded in one way or another. And uh, in our field, I'm not sure it's any different. This is a photograph of one of the very first ATSA conferences. People in our field trying to get together to, uh, 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 to figure out what can we do to properly assess and treat people who have abused. Um, I see some smiling faces as we recognize some of our uh, sort of collective uh, um, ancestors. So one of the things that we did learn in those days is that, is that there's many motivations for sex crimes. When I came into the field, people talked about sex offenders as if they were some sort of discrete form of, of humankind, and came to find out it's actually anything but. That, uh, that there's all sorts of motivations for sex crimes. The first of them is sexual. Somebody has a sexual interest in, in something that if they act on it is going to be illegal or abusive, period, end of story. And then as we know, there's many people who abuse as a result of non-sexual needs or, or desires. Just to be blunt about it, some people can be mean. They're not maybe mean all the time, but they're mean on that day, or they're drunk, or they're angry, or they're uncaring and select somebody of convenience to them. Maybe it's all of the above. But it's not the case that everybody who abuses sexually abuses out of sexual motiv uh, motivations. And James Cantor will be talking about that some more in just a moment. And then there was this fellow here, Robert Martinson, who came along in 1974. 
He wrote an article that made him a very, very famous man. And if you do a Google search on him, you can still find interviews that he did for People magazine in the mid-1970s. He didn't really check his numbers all that well, and he published this article that said, basically, criminal justice rehabilitation programs just don't seem to be bearing any fruit. And the, the evidence to the contrary came out the next year, in 1975. And by 1979, he wrote an article that basically said, I was wrong. And, uh, and he died the following winter, basically, uh, basically disgraced. And I mention him because in many ways his ghost is still in this room. With all of our mythology that people can't change or that treatment doesn't work, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's many controversies in the field, of course, but we, uh, we have to be careful how we listen to stuff that we hear in the media about whether or not uh, we can, our efforts uh, are going to be successful. By the time the 1980s rolled around, there were some influential studies. Um, some of you who rode with these fellows might recognize them as the Hells Angels from the 1960s. I just like putting the picture in. But we, uh, we started finding out, both in practice and in research, that before people get caught for sex crimes, they tend to have done it quite a bit in their past. Um, and they weren't caught, leading us to think, well, maybe then they're all at high risk and destined to this lifetime of havoc and destruction. Maybe we need to um, uh, make treatment even more uh, strong, harsh, confrontational, uh, or what have you. And the simple fact is, there is a very big difference between somebody who comes to the attention of the legal system and somebody who doesn't. And that I think the most recent numbers I saw were that 95% of people arrested for a sex crime, it's their first and only time being arrested for a sex crime. Obviously, that leaves 5% of people who we have to take very, very seriously. But we began to realize not all sex offenders are equally dangerous. And that really it would take a vast amount of research evidence to, uh, to demonstrate otherwise. And so the first actuarial measure to figure out or to classify uh, sex offenders according to their dangerousness really came out around 1997. Promising starts before then, but 1997 is within living memory for, for most of us. So much has changed, but the word isn't necessarily getting out as well as it should. And then there's all the controversies around treatment. The first, the, uh, the first review of treatment studies um, wasn't particularly optimistic and led many of us to a kind of therapeutic nihilism, or uh, shall we say, that uh, we, uh, we started to panic, or at least we weren't as optimistic as maybe we should have been. And f subsequent studies came along saying, hmm, People who complete treatment programs really do seem to, uh, to reoffend at lower rates. And then other studies came along to, uh, to back this up a little bit. And then along came one analysis that I think is really important. It found that, our, uh, that the most effective programs seem to um, dole out the most intensive services to those who pose the greatest risk. There are also the programs that specifically target scientifically proven treatment goals. And finally, there are also the programs that actually work very hard to make sure that the services they're providing are actually understood and meaningful to the, to the clients in treatment, something that is all too easy to overlook. We've also learned that people who actually successfully uh, complete their treatment goals really do seem to reoffend at lower rates, even if we can't show it in some of our highest quality studies. Time is short here today, but if I were to put it all together, I would uh, borrow from the work of my, uh, my friend Gwenda Willis, uh, as well as Doug Bauer, and say that the safest sex offender is somebody who's stable, somebody who's occupied with a job or education, has supportive people in his or her life to whom he's accountable, has some kind of plan for the future, and has everything to lose by repeating this behavior. So that's just a brief overview. Thanks for your time. Hi, uh, I'm uh, James Cantor. I'm a uh, psychologist and sexual behavior scientist at the University of, uh, of Toronto, and I'm editor-in-chief of uh, SageArt, a sexual abuse, a journal of research and treatment. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to teach you brain anatomy. Really, 
It's very strange to be somebody who studies the brain and studies sex at the same time because we know so little of it. But it's, I get the same set of questions over and over and over again. I just call them the big questions. We don't actually, of course, have the time to really do any kind of brain anatomy, but I'll show you the kind of evidence that uh, my team and other teams have been producing that have shown us that pedophilia actually is a phenomenon of the brain. There has been for many, many years the belief, and it's only been a belief, that we call it the abused abuser hypothesis, that being the victim of abuse causes somebody to be an abuser in adulthood. Although that seems obvious to many of us, if we think about it for a second, there are some important clues that that theory doesn't explain. Almost all of the abusers are male. The majority of the victims are female. If this were just a like-makes-like -like phenomenon, we should see more equal numbers, but we don't. This is one of the most unequal sex ratios known to all of behavioral science. So there's something missing in the idea of like-makes-like -like and the, uh, the abused-abuser hypothesis. Now, the idea that this is in the, that one, excellent. The idea that, uh, uh, that pedophilia is in the brain actually is a very old idea. It goes back to the 1800s. Only Freud uh, uh, published after that, and he was much more popular because he wrote in English. The other researchers at the time wrote largely in Latin because they thought all the sex dis uh, discussion would be too intense for the public, so they didn't want the uneducated reading, so they wrote in Latin and German, so nobody read it, even though it turned out in the long term to be the correct theory. These are the big questions, and I'll get back to them at the end. I want to make a very, very big distinction between these two terms, which are unfortunately still treated as synonyms. They're not. Pedophilia is not the same as child molestation. Even in the media, they're treated as synonyms. They're different things. Pedophilia is the actual sexual interest, sexual preference, sexual uh, arousal in response to children. Child molestation is the actual behavior. They're, of course, very strongly overlapping. In the great majority, in many of the cases, pedophilia is what's motivating the child molestation. But there are pedophiles, people who are sexually interested in children, and never act on it. In fact, they're beginning to form support groups that, you know, doc, I got a problem. But they often feel like they can't talk to their own doctors because of mandatory reporting uh, requirements. If a father comes in, tells his physician, psychologist, psychiatrist that he's attracted to children, very, uh, in very many circumstances and in very many jurisdictions, the care provider is required to report that case to the authorities. Now, of course, therefore, the pedophile himself knows that, so he doesn't go in and report it to begin with. So all we've done with mandatory reporting laws is that instead of having pedophiles out in society getting support, we have pedophiles out in society receiving no support or treatment. They are feel safer. We have passed laws that are making things worse, not better, out of hysteria. OK, now this is some of the uh, uh, evidence that uh, started uh, my team. And there are two other teams in the world working on uh, the role of the brain in pedoph uh, pedophilia. Again, there's my team in Canada and two other teams in, uh, in Germany. Where are the Americans? Now, one of the first clues that we had, this is what we call, uh, call a meta-analysis. It was a study of studies. And in studies, over and over again, we found a relatively subtle effect, but a very replicated and predictable, uh, predictable effect. Basic IQ tests, a standard part of most, uh, most assessments. The IQs of people who commit uh, sexual offenses against children and people who uh, are genuinely pedophilic, both, have lower IQs than people who don't. To a neuroscientist, uh, IQ is kind of like a blood pressure. It's just a basic idea of health in the brain. So this was one of the first ideas that something in the brain was different among pedophiles than non-pedophiles. We continued with the same kind of, uh, of, uh, of research. Maybe the dumb pedophiles are more likely to get caught. Turned out we got the same result with memory tests. OK, well, memory is kind of related to IQ. Maybe it's something specific to the, uh, uh, to the memory test. We found it both in verbal memory and in nonverbal memory. We found it in the propensity to get involved in accidents that were severe enough, head injuries that were severe enough to cause unconsciousness, but only when they happened before age 13 and not after. There was no difference with older or adult head injuries. 
Now, of course, starting in the 1970s, people stopped failing grades and said we assign people to uh, special education programs. But if you add them, somewhere around two-thirds of pedophiles, actual pedophiles, people who were sexually interested in children, failed a grade or were uh, referred to special education programs. The base rate, the number of people in most of society, that's about 3%. Something is going on, and important with this, this was before any offense happened. The head injuries were also before anything in the offense happened. So the idea that, well, maybe low IQ people are more likely to get caught, or low IQ pedophiles are more likely to get caught, barring a time machine, there is no way that the ones who got caught went backwards and then failed a grade. There was something that happened on the way forward. We're starting to get links that something was different about these people early in life. Physically shorter, and I say that a bit self-consciously. <laughs> the amount by which a pedophile is less short than people who committed uh, uh, offenses against, uh, sexual offenses against adults or people who committed no offenses at all is about two and a half centimeters. That's double the difference you would get when a woman smokes while she's pregnant. There's no way that this kind of thing causes somebody to be a bit, uh, uh, there is no way that height is a result of arrest or a result of committing an offense. Height and a uh, peak height is something that happens before the offenses do. So whatever, again, whatever was different in these people was different before the offenses. It, handedness was probably the biggest clue. Handedness in humans develops in utero, while, while there's still a fetus in the mother's womb. In fact, on sonograms, fetuses will show a preference for which thumb they suck that you can see on the sonogram. And that, uh, that, thumb, that thumb preference in adulthood becomes their handedness. Well, the only way, and here we have roughly 30% instead of in the regular population, it's 8 to 10%. So it's triple that. The only other groups that have that elevated rate of non-right-handedness are people with you know, well-acknowledged uh, neurological disorders, schizophrenia, autism, and so on. Whatever it was that made these people different, the only way to explain this is that that difference had to have been there at this point before birth. I can't tell you what the chain of events is, but the only way to explain this is whatever the chain of events is, the first links of that chain had to be before birth. There's no other way to explain it. So on the basis of you know, this pile of research, then started uh, getting us the, uh, 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 the justification to start doing this directly. Can we see a difference in the brains of pedophiles versus non-pedophiles in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the actual brain anatomy directly? The short answer is yes. There have been a series of studies. We're still disagreeing over exactly where in the brain, but we have each been able to find uh, specific uh, differences in the anatomy of the brain when you compare a pedophile versus non-pedophile. This one was from, uh, from my group. OK, now everybody, as you can see, this is the superior occipital frontal fasciculus of the left hemisphere and arcuate fasciculus of the right hemisphere. Say it again with me. <laughs> To me, when we saw it on brain scans, it kind of looked like Marge Simpson holding a frying pan. <laughs> OK, but ultimately what it meant, and we found differences in an unexpected place, we found differences actually in the connective tissue of the brain, which I never expected. But it turns out that the areas of the brain that are connected by, those, uh, by this white matter stuff are the areas of the brain that individually respond to sexual stimulus. The visual centers, no surprise. The motor control areas, as the person is imagining going through the motions, again, no surprise. Sensory integration, and one part where people suppress their own behavior because everything's only happening in their imagination. So given the evidence that it's in the brain brings us to the big questions. As you know, the neurofolk, uh, neurofolk try to figure out exactly where in the brain is it, it's hard to explain this without it. Some people still ask, is it in the genes? Probably not. There's no evidence, there's no direct good evidence that it is in the genes. People who are pedophilic are much less likely to reproduce. You'd think that it would have died out through evolution already, but it hasn't, which seems to argue that it's not genetic. Perhaps some interaction, uh, maternal stress during the pregnancy, if, uh, uh, if the mother or the family environment you know, were poorly nourished or something else. Perhaps it's something that we can control and prevent even before the fetus is born. 
So can they, uh, are they born with it? I'm not sure that they're born with it. It's possible that they're born merely with a risk. But if we can figure out which of these infants, pregnancies, young people are at risk for developing pedophilia to begin with, well, we know that we can't turn a pedophile into a non-pedophile in adulthood, but if we can find that early link, if we can find where the whole thing starts, then not only are we, uh, will we be in the position to prevent the second offense, which is the reason we have the justice system, but if we can figure out what that first link is, then we can prevent the first offense. Now, this is usually what I, uh, what I see, uh, uh, hear from the public when we talk about, you know, can we change uh, the brain or a pregnancy to result in uh, turning a pedophile into a non-pedophile? Those of you who are a certain age might remember this as, a, uh, as Clockwork Orange. But really, my fears are the reverse. The Frankenstein villagers, once you have the idea, even though we all very easily will sign on to the idea of eliminating pedophilia, what kind of social and biological control over other human beings are we talking about doing, and are we willing to do that? Now, all of a sudden, we have two very, very important principles fighting each other. So, these are the various groups that, that I hear from. And unfortunately, each one has a piece of the actual truth. Each one of them has the right to their, uh, to their own views and their own emotions, but that it has become such a yelling match in so many different areas that no one of them actually is taking a whole perspective in figuring out what will solve the entire problem as opposed to addressing their individual experiences. Although I appreciate their individual experiences, often the thing that most benefits one group is at the cost of another group, and we need to take a much more holistic approach. So instead of what we're doing now, which is looking at the situation in a very black and white way, we need to start looking at it really in a system of grays. We're not always going to be sure who the offender is, and we're not only uh, uh, the potential offender is. We're only going to be able to come up with a percentage. But really, my hope is that where we can go with MRI-based research is to continue with the protections of the public. We can't force anybody into, uh, into treatment, and we need to maintain their confidentiality. But by the same token, as I say, if we can figure out whatever general factor it is that puts a person at risk for developing pedophilia, then instead of preventing, as I say, the second offense, we can prevent the first one. And I always like to close with this uh, quote uh, uh, from Magnus Hirschfeld, one of my heroes. My greatest hope really is that we can establish justice through science. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, James, and thank you, David. As before, I'm very happy to have questions. So if any of the tables have questions, we can pick them up. Hold on. Oops, that's what I was afraid of. Because you want, you want both hands. Yeah. Okay. What if the government spent funding on rehab and treatment of sex offenders as opposed to prison? So, my right. question. The, uh, uh, the amount of money that goes into uh, uh, incarcerating somebody, depending on the state, is uh, uh, in some places $100,000 per person per year, and in some states with specialized programs, $200,000 per person per year. The amount of money that I spent in the research grant to conduct all of these things would be paid for by the amount of money of having one person in jail. If this ultimately leads to a way to prevent it, if I prevent one victim and prevent one person from, uh, from uh, uh, committing an act, all of this research would have paid for, it, uh, for itself. But as I say, where are the Americans? This isn't clearly is not a matter of not being willing to spend the money. It's an unwillingness to spend the money intelligently. All of the money goes into cleaning up the mess instead of preventing the mess. But the cost effectiveness of the prevention and figuring out the original problem is, talk about chump change, a small, small fraction of the enormous amount of money that goes into the correctional system. I, should, I want to say correctional system. Maybe I can add something too. Every time you read a scientific journal, 
you, you see somewhere in the limitation section, it says more research is needed. There's a couple of places where research really isn't needed anymore. The, the jury's back in that punishing people at great expense doesn't reduce their risk. If we want to punish people, then society should punish people. But if we actually want them to change and not get worse, we need to do something else. I didn't quite catch the entirety of the um, original question. Um, I don't care where the money for rehabilitation comes from as long as it comes from, uh, from someplace. But obviously, punishment is not r really helping us very much. Treatment can work. It is, there's certainly controversy around the active um, ingredients in it, and it seems to work a little bit better if you have good treatment providers teamed up with good supervising agents. This is where we should be putting our efforts, and this is what's really newsworthy and doesn't get reported. And we have time for one more, if any other table has a question that they'd like me to read out. How do we best bring together the sometimes competing views and agendas of survivors, treatment providers, law enforcement, and politicians, et cetera? <laughs> a long, long time ago, a woman named Faye Honeynop went into the Vermont prisons and said, if we're ever really going to understand how to beat the problem of sexual violence, we need to understand the person um, who's doing the violence. And in my career, I've actually, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, you don't understand, my dad's a good guy. You don't understand, I really miss my brother. This stuff is really complicated. The, I only have a very abstract answer, I guess. One is, regardless of how we come into each of these situations, it is tough to think about pedophilia or any sexual violence without an emotion. We're humans, that's what we do. But we have more than one set of emotions. We have, what happened to me? What do I change? How do I deal with it? How do I live my life? How do I integrate this into my understanding of myself? And we also have all of society, what is best for all of us, and in the abstract, even though I might want this person killed, well, I'm also not a death penalty kind of a person, and I have, I'm of mixed minds of this. So depending on how a person became interested in the topic, those are the parts that are very, very personal to each of us. But to work on a social level, it's often more helpful to, okay, I have my baggage, but now we need to think, once we get past each of our own baggage, the rest is what we have in common, which will prevent somebody like me from needing to be here, whether that's somebody coming in with a scientific interest or some personal experience of, of, of having gone through the system one way or another. But I think the, 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 one of the hardest things to watch, I'm a dual citizen American Canadian, one of the hardest things that's, uh, that is, one of the hardest things it's been for me to watch now in Canada was to watch American culture become so angry and so punitive that I want to rename the Department of Justice the Department of Vengeance. Instead of justice, instead of fixing the problem, it's about how do I get the system to express my anger? I understand my anger, but my anger isn't going to fix the problem. It's not going to unmake a victim. Now and then we need to take a deep breath and sometimes and work together on the areas of which are common interest. So even though we may have come in with different interests, it's the stuff that we can do together that I think will ultimately solve our mutual interest and problem. And just because I'm jet lagged and forgot a, a, a big piece of what I want to say is this is precisely why ATSA exists. That when I came into the field, people would say things like, I don't know how you can work with those people. And increasingly, I hear from victims advocates, we really need to join up. We need to join forces. ATSA has managed to form all kinds of interesting collaborations with NSVRC and NCMEC and all, uh, you know, all manners of other organizations. The simple fact of the matter is we're at our best when we pick up the phone and talk to each other. And I'm really, really pleased to be living in a time when we're actually doing that when we didn't do that 20, 25 years ago. So I guess my, uh, my, the, the best answer to the question is join ATSA and all the other organizations too and get involved.
next two speakers, um, Sandra Henriquez and Tom Tobin. Hi, good evening, everyone. So Tom and I wanted to start by just doing a little kind of skit for you um, about some work that we're doing here in California and how that actually got started. So want to intro yourself a little more? Sure. Oh, OK, yes, I think that's a good idea. All right. I'm Sandra Henriquez, the executive director of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And we represent, my organization represents 84 rape crisis center programs that serve um, victims in every geographic location of California. Um, the programs also do a lot in terms of trying to prevent sexual violence to begin with. So um, that's what I do, and that's how I came to know uh, people from ATSA and uh, Tom. So um, I'm Tom Tobin. I'm a California psychologist up in Northern California. I work with an agency that works with adult sex offenders, trying to help them so that they never reoffend. Um, and I want to thank whoever asked that last question, and I want to thank the responders, because that's kind of exactly what happened. So as Sandra said, we want to play just a little bit with you. These are not the exact facts. This is the super condensed version. But this is kind of what happened. Oh, hello. Yes, hello. Um, I, I've never met you. Um, my name is Tom Tobin, and um, I know that you are the executive director of CalCASA. Um, I'm with an organization called the California Coalition on Sexual Offending, and we work with sex offenders, um, and I, I know sometimes people who do your kind of work don't like to talk to people who do my kind of work, but I really thought it would be a good idea for us to talk and connect and and see if there's some possibility of uh, collaborating in some way. Um, Tom, uh, thanks for reaching out to me. And since you called me, I imagine that you're really, you understand the kind of work that I do and the work that CalCASA does in that we represent the rape crisis center programs that basically serve victims around the state of California. Um, and so just, just to be honest with you, some of the people that I work with um, don't generally have an interest in working with people that work with offenders. Um, so I, you know, it's interesting that you should call. Um, I do think, though, that just in terms of some of the work that maybe that you're doing, it seems that you um, are working to also prevent future sexual violence, which is definitely something that we're interested in. We're obviously interested in preventing sexual violence altogether, but certainly preventing any kind of um, reoffense. So I think it's interesting that you called and definitely think that um, we should get together and talk. And you know, maybe you have, since you called me, maybe you have some ideas about how, what that might look like and how we could work together. Wow, I'm really glad to feel welcomed by you. I know it's a kind of a tough relationship, but yeah, actually, um, I do have an idea. Um, and that is something that's been done in some other states, which is, you know, there's so many different people that, and agencies and organizations and branches of government that have something to do with sexual offending and with responding to sexual offending. And what some of these other states have done is create what, what they call a sex offender management board. And I thought, well, maybe we could collaborate and see if we could get something like that to happen in California. I know those other boards have victim representatives who play a major role. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an interesting idea, and I think um, maybe one that we can talk about more and consider, and maybe even think about other kinds of people that would, um, I, you know, I don't know that much about it, I'm sure you, you know, since you know what these other states are doing, but maybe even look at um, in, ensuring that some of the courts, like the courts in California are involved and county administrators. And you know, Tom, interestingly, CalCASA is about to develop a new strategic plan. So we're in the process of doing that. And this, you know, I think if we talk more and, and kind of explore this, this might be something, you know, a particular project that we may be interested in including in that plan is, and maybe something that we can work on in terms of uh, going forward. 
Wow, that would be great. So let's connect later and see if we can make something happen. Great. Thanks. Okay, sure. Bye. Okay. So now I'm calling Tom, follow-up phone call. Ring. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Tom. It's Sandra Henriquez with Calcasa. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. 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 Um, remember when we were talking last and I mentioned that we were going to put this idea about a sex offender management board into our strategic plan? Yeah, So I we actually yeah. did that. We oh, did great. that. And um, Assemblywoman Judy Chu from the California legislature was reviewing our strategic plan, and she really wanted to do something and, and, and um, introduce some legislation on our behalf, and um, this was actually something she was interested in. So I'm wondering if we can get together and talk and maybe come up with some language um, that we can give her so that she can help introduce um, some legislation on our behalf. Wow, that is really exciting. Yeah, I'd love to do it. Let's set a time and let's uh, try to make this happen. Oh, I'm, a, I'm just bowled over. This is great news. Talk to you later. Okay. Okay. Third, fast forward, third phone call. About, <laughs> I don't know how many months later, but third phone call. <laughs> hi, Tom. Yeah, hi, Sam. Hi. Are you sitting down? Um, no, but I'll hold on. Well, you might want to sit down. You might okay. want to sit down. <laughs> okay, I have good news for you, Tom. Um, well, the bill that we've been working on actually passed through the legislature unanimously. Oh. And it was signed into law by the governor. Oh. That yeah. is such fantastic news. Wow. Well, I guess it's going to be more than a collaboration to make it happen. It's going to be a collaboration to put it into, into reality. So, so let's, let's get going. So yeah, we have a yeah. lot of work to do now. So why don't we get together and talk and so that we can look at how, what this partnership continues to look like and look at who else needs to be at the table. I think it's a huge step in California in terms of advancing uh, sex offender management and ensuring that the communities are safer and that we work and do what we can together to try and uh, prevent repeat offenses um, by identified offenders. You said it, prevent repeat offenses by identified offenders. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thanks, bye. Okay. So, not the total truth, but the condensed version. This is what happened. So, um, actually, this afternoon, the California Sex Offender Management Board met in this very hotel. Are any members here tonight? One, two, three, four, a few back there. Okay, um, that's great. So, uh, working with Calcasa, this, this actually came to pass. And uh, the board's been meeting now for, mm, I think, eight years, maybe. And I think we've accomplished a fair amount. Uh, the goal has been collaboration among all those different groups. There's a handout back there, or you can go on the board's website if you're a Californian interested in this. Um, collaboration to prevent future sexual abuse by identified sex offenders. Now, if you've been listening careful, carefully tonight, you'll realize this is just a small part of the big pie because identified sex offenders are not the big problem. Myth dispelled. The big problem is the culture that creates and perpetuates the possibilities of sexual abuse. But our task, the Sex Offender Management Board, is what can we do to stop known offenders from reoffending? Well, we look around, we see various things that California has decided to do. The principle that drives the board and drives what the board tries to accomplish is let's look at the evidence, let's look at the research, let's not just do what our guts say will make us feel better. So there are some things that have been tried, and there are some, if you will, weapons we can use. And um, um, here's one of them. This should take care of some sex offenders, I think, if we do it just right. This is sex offender registration. And sex offender registration will definitely prevent sex offenders from reoffending. Right? Wrong. There's some value in it but it does not prevent reoffending, and the research now is pretty clear. It tells us that. Well, so we'll save a little bit of it. What about what often goes with that? Community notification. If people know who the sex offenders are that live in their neighborhood and can find out easily, that will prevent future sexual offending, right? 
you know where it's going. Wrong. It's just not true. And the research supports, you've heard it already tonight, the research says it's not true. Notification doesn't prevent future sexual offending. OK, oh, well, listen. If we just keep these sex offenders away from places where, especially where children are, so let's put in residence restrictions so that they can't live near schools, near parks, near places where children gather. That'll stop it, right? Residence restrictions. Let's put it on a ballot and have the people of California pass it by 70% margin. That'll solve the problem, right? Or at least it will prevent some sexual reoffending. Here we go. Absolutely wrong. Not only that, we're not even saving a part of this because the research suggests that it makes things worse. You saw, sex offenders, to be safe, need to be stable, need to have a life worth living. That does just the opposite. Well, what else could we do? Ah, we keep them away from where children gather during the day. We'll set up exclusion zones. A very hot topic in California right now, and it's going to get hotter next year. So is there evidence that says exclusion zones prevent sexual offenders from reoffending? There is not. Well, what about monitoring them? Put those ankle bracelets on. We'll know where they are at every moment. Is there any evidence, including the statements by the people that, that uh, sell these devices, that says this will prevent future sexual offending? There is not. Back up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> OK. So, well, maybe we just lock them up forever, throw away the key, send them to prison, send them to a civil commitment program. Well, yeah, that actually might stop them. But as you already heard, I think we, we can't afford that. It's a ridiculous waste of money, especially since we know that 5% of the, of the new sexual offenses are not committed by these identified sexual offenders. So should we have prison? Should we have jail? Do some of them need to be uh, incarcerated to protect the community? Absolutely. We will keep some of that. But to think of it as the big solution, forget it. It's ridiculous. All right. Then we've got um, supervision. If we really intensely supervise these people, parole agents, probation officers, watch them night and day, will that stop them from future sexual offending? The research says, no, it won't all by itself. It just doesn't. But wait, we do know more. We do know that when you combine good, intensive supervision and communication and collaboration with a good, solid, evidence-based treatment program, things start to happen. And then we'll add one more that has, I'll admit it, shaky research base, but it's frequently used and it seems to work in a lot of places. And that is, some people would say it's surveillance. It's keeping an eye on them by other people, by their families, by their boss, by other people in the community, by law enforcement. But then one big part of this is the polygraph, giving them lie detector tests to find out, are they behaving? Are they following the rules? Are they doing what they need to do? Are they staying away from high-risk situations? So now what we have created is a triangle. That's these different agencies and individuals who have specialties, different, but who communicate with each other all the time. The offender is in the middle. And that's what seems to make a difference in terms of stopping reoffending. Treatment alone, without supervision, and forcing them into treatment, it, it, it's, it won't work. It, nobody will show up, or very few. But once they're in treatment, you'd be surprised how many of them say, you know, I thought I hated this, but it's actually a big help to me. So this is what the California Sex Offender Management Board has proposed and recommended repeatedly to the policymakers of the state of California. 
and the policymakers have adopted it. So we are now in the process of rolling out the containment model in California. There are 6,000 parolees who now have treatment with contracted providers, have supervision with increasingly well-trained parole agents, and who are required to have a polygraph as a part of that. It's state law, it's happening, it's gonna happen. Probation is happening, but a little slower for many, many reasons. But we think we're on the right track. We think that in terms of this little piece of the pie, managing sex offenders who have previously offended and stopping them from reoffending, we think we're doing the right thing. So, thank you. Now I feel bad because I don't have all those good props that Tom had. <laughs> anyway, we, we um, gave you a little intro in terms of the way that our Sex Offender Management Board came to uh, be here in California, part of the way. Um, and so I, I want to go back and acknowledge um, a couple of the executive directors that came before me. And first was Mary Beth Carter, who really was the visionary that um, actually put, made sure that that got into the strategic plan. And then after her, um, so after she left, Suzanne Brown McBride really picked up the work and kept um, doing that and advancing the work in terms of that. So when I started as the executive director of Cal Casa in, in November of 2010, and I got the phone call <laughs> from the governor's office about um, the appointment, you know, I, I, um, my first reaction was certainly of surprise because I'd spent 20 plus years of my career working for and on behalf of sexual assault victims. So it was quite a surprise, um, however, um, you know, one of the things that we do in the in the movement in the field working to um, help and prevent sexual violence is that we look at all of the systems. We look at what are the systems that we have to interface with that we to improve things. What are those systems? Are they, you know, obviously criminal justice, um, campuses, uh, detention, and and jails and prisons and all of those kinds of things. And and so. Part of the work is to, to, in terms of advancing it, is to interface with those systems and to see how we can improve them. So I had a huge learning curve ahead of me and I, when I joined the board. Um, and, but one of the things that I learned, and because I've worked for so many years with um, sexual assault survivors, is that you know, obviously we know that most survivors are um, assaulted by somebody that they know, right? And, the other thing that I had heard and learned many years in terms of working with victims is that a lot of times, if it's particularly if it's somebody in the family, it's somebody that they love and that they want to continue to have a relationship with. What they don't want is the behavior. What they don't want is the, the sexual um, uh, behavior of a sexual nature, but they do want to continue to have a, a relationship with them. And one of the things that I began to put together from working with and on behalf of survivors um, and then learning what I was learning in terms of working with the Sex Offender Management um, uh, Board was that you know, a lot of our policies and approaches are sometimes contributing to a climate where the family members and even the survivors are um, ending up feeling like they have to lie and hide and sneak around because they want to still protect this individual. So when the, the, the offender comes out of prison, they, they're somewhere that they need to go, and oftentimes it's their families that want to take them back. So one of the things I began to look at and really think about was really in terms of our work around preventing reoffense. And that prevention was the place where we could connect and intersect with the sex offender management uh, uh, people. And so, um, you know, I really began thinking about in terms of a lot of the survivors that we worked with and the, and the survivors that the programs that I represent work with was really if we could have conversations and, you know, because one of the things that allows sexual violence to continue is the secretiveness, the fact that it's a secret. But if we could you know, normalize the discussion around 
the reality and who does it and why it happens and those kinds of things. And we could educate, effectively educate the families and the communities around the risk factors and what happens when those risks go up and the things to be looking out for. Um, so when Uncle Johnny loses his job or when Uncle Johnny can't get a job or when, you know, these kinds of things or when Uncle Johnny can't go to the park with us and, you know, all of these kinds of things. What, you know, th those are things that, you know, I've learned that help to increase the risk factors. And so if we could talk about those and identify those within the families and the, within the communities and everybody could say, hey, Uncle Johnny, we know it's not a secret. And you know, everybody's keeping an eye, we still love you, but everybody's keeping an eye on this situation. And the real and that people really could know, couldn't we then help to prevent this from happening in the future? Um, by eliminating, you know, the secrets, by eliminating the shame of this having happened within the home or within the family. The other place that I really, you know, thought about was also in terms of the policies, and that's also something that I, you know, learned in terms of being involved with the Sex Offender Management Board, is really that so many of the policies that we're putting into place do come from a reactionary place and a place of fear, and probably things that years ago I would have absolutely supported, but because I've learned that so many of the policies that we have in place are actually increasing the risk, um, and that they're not really helpful, Tom just did his, his um, visual there about that, then you know, I think that this is an area where we can work together. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult because people look, I know the first time I went to a COSO conference, I don't know if I've ever said this to anybody but, on the board, but the first time I went to a COSO conference and I called somebody about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm at this conference, what they said to me, and this was somebody that worked on the victim advocate side, what they said to me is, oh, you're not flipping over to the other side, are you? I mean, and, and it was kind of a shock to me, but it demonstrated to me the amount of work that really needs to happen. And so I think the charge ahead of, you know, those of us who work and provide leadership in terms of um, victim advocacy is really to try and figure out where those connections are and to create those bridges. Because, you know, as Tom mentioned, we're, we're, we're working now with the containment model here in California, and we have a lot of work to do. And part of that work really involves um, getting victim advocates invested and understanding why we should be working together and how, you know, that it's critical to have their voices at the table informing policies, informing um, victim-centered approaches that take into consideration, you know, the victims, and that it's just critical that our voices are there as these policies are being made, as the prevention approaches and efforts are, are, are underway. So um, that's really what I wanted to share, and just that we have a lot of work to do, but I know that at CalCASA we're, we're up for uh, the charge, and we're definitely looking to work more closely with ATSA and make sure that that happens uh, here in California. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. We're so happy to be here and talk about this important topic. As it was mentioned earlier that this is a complex topic, it's a heavy topic, but we all have a vested interest in this topic. Uh, so tonight, Joan and I, we're going to talk about understanding the ripple effects and how we can all get involved to prevent sexual violence. I'm Tracy Cox, and I'm from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, and I'm, jo and I'm joined tonight by... I'm Joan Tabachnik, and I'm from DSM Consulting, and also I could say that I'm um, like too close. And I'm also um, doing a, a fellowship actually with the Department of Justice, I need to say that, James, um, the SMART office. So I actually have a fellowship in sexual violence prevention, which to me is a very encouraging moment because they are investing in sexual violence prevention. Um, I'm also very excited that so many people here stayed um, for the whole time, so thank you. We weren't quite sure how many people would be here. And, um, and also to say that, that um, we're, we're excited, but this is actually the positive part that we're going we're gonna to be attacking tonight. Yeah, so to um, just build upon what was already discussed earlier, um, each of us does have a role to play, and each of us can be part of that solution. So tonight when you leave here, there are a couple objectives that we want to cover. So when you leave, you'll be able to answer not only what you can do as an individually, 
individual, but like as what we can do collectively. Okay, so just maybe just building a little bit on what we've already talked about tonight. So um, our first speakers talked a little bit about how sexual violence is, um, is a public health issue, which means that it's not inevitable, it's actually preventable. And that's a very hopeful message that most of society is not hearing. Uh, second, that um, the, sa the safest sex offender is someone who's stable, who's someone who's em employed, um, has a family support, um, and somebody to hold them accountable. And what's ironic about that is that a known offender is actually the one who's a safer offender. And, um, but it also speaks to the importance that all of us have a role in helping to hold them accountable. And um, that's something that we need to take, take, get, get involved in which I think segues so well to the next message, which is that um, managing sex offenders in the community is a very complex uh, concept, um, and that collaboration is key, which again means it takes all of us to be involved. And last, what we'll be talking about tonight is that there are practical, everyday, everyday um, actions that you can do, that we can do, um, to prevent sexual violence. Indeed. Um, so how many news junkies are in the room tonight? Anybody, like addicted to news? Um, great, I'm not alone. Um, as a former journalist, uh, I, I call myself a news junkie, and it doesn't take long to just scan the headlines online, or you pick up the paper, or you turn on the TV, and you see that this topic is everywhere. Um, as depicted on this slide, um, it's on the national radar. Uh, just earlier this year, the White House unveiled several initiatives to combat sexual violence. Uh, most recently, last month in September, they unleashed um, a new campaign geared at curbing and preventing sexual violence on campus. So we are definitely at a tipping point. So how do we take these stories that we see in the news every day, happening on a, on a large, high profile national um, on stage, and talk about them in our daily lives with the people that we love and really apply the local voice to that. Um, one way is uh, through the work of the NSVRC, we engage media and journalists, and we try to help them see that this is a very complex topic. And, and that, that was talked about earlier tonight, that it's not easy. So we want them to be um, knowledgeable and be able to report on this accurately. Because as a journalist, I know that there are several um, old school uh, reporters and everything, uh, especially in TV news, that have that mantra, if it bleeds, it leads. And unfortunately, in those stories, the TV news and, and, the, and stuff that you see, it's usually the most horrific, um, the horrible, worst case crimes. And that was mentioned earlier, a lot of the stranger danger stuff that we think is happening all over, it's not the case. In the majority of cases, the victim knows the person who's sexually abusing them. So it's helping train the media and helping them see that um, there are victims, there is prevention, giving them a greater context to this issue. Um, and one way that we did that was with the Jerry Sandusky case a couple years ago out of Penn State University. We worked with ATSA on a letters to the editor campaign. And it was wildly popular, because what we did is we set up some letters, sample letters, and we allowed people to download them, and they could either submit them to their local papers, or they could use that as a spark, a starting point, and they could write their own localized letter to the editor to get this conversation started. Because this isn't an issue that just happens at Penn State. It isn't an issue that just happens in the military. It isn't an issue that just happens on college campuses. Um, everyone here probably is able to talk about a story that happens within their local communities, at their schools. So we wanted that to, to start that discussion, to let people know that it's happening everywhere and that prevention is possible. So these are just some high profile cases and events that's happened within the last couple of years. So the fact the media is talking about it, um, but there, um, if you think about sort of the image that people have when you say sex offender, um, there's actually a term now called, um, that I've just heard recently called a visual hammer. So when you say sex offender, the visual image that we all have is very, very powerful. I'm, I know for me, um, when I, the age that I grew up in, it was, you know, it was the uh, dirty old man in a trench coat lurking on the edge of the playground. I mean, that's a very vivid image. I asked my niece recently when I say sex offender, and yes, we do talk about it in our family. Um, she's she's uh, uh, in high school and said, like, well, you know, when I say sex offender, what do you, who do you think of? Or what do you think of? What's the image? She would see things like an overweight, over, overweight man sitting in his mom's basement lurking on the internet. So 
we have these images, they're very powerful images. Um, and, um, and then also you think about the words. I also do an exercise, I ask people when I say the, you know, the word sex offender, you know, what, do you, what words come to mind? And you know, people come up with, you know, start off saying you know, maybe you know, a guy you know, lurking, but then they'll, start come up with, you know, they'll come up with like creep, you know, creep sicko, pervert, you know, it gets worse and worse. And if you ask what feeling words come up, you know, the feeling words are anger, fury, resentment. Um, so this is when we say the word sex offender, that's what people are imagining. That's the pushback. Um, so, and that stereotype is getting reinforced um, by the, what, what Tracy was just saying in terms of bleeds it leads. And um, one of the things that sort of I think about, like what if we began to replace that, that, that visual image with more something more like this? Given all the statistics that we were talking about, this happens with someone we know, someone in our family, um, that if we're talking about thinking about how do you have that conversation, if you're thinking about you know, the dirty old man looking on the edge of the playground, it's really hard to think about how am I going to talk to him. But if this is the image that we have, how would you have that conversation, maybe like with a little boy in the blue shirt in the front? So you may want to start to say, like, you know, that, you know, talk about you know, in the usual conversations you might hear in school that no one has the right to touch you. You might also begin to say, and you remember, and you actually don't have the right to touch someone else. Begin that conversation at a very early age. And, um, and think about these are images and conversations that we can have um, that with each other. And that leads to a whole different sort of uh, point of action. So, Oh, sorry. Um, no, go for it. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, so basically, that, um, there's sort of a growing um, interest, I think, in what's called bystander intervention, particularly in college campuses. Um, and there's a brochure that the NSVRC put out that, um, that I, I authored that's out in the back that's for free. And partly, if you think about bystander intervention, is really about how do we, how do we learn how to talk about it? And if so child sexual abuse and sexual violence in general thrives in isolation and thrives in silence, it's an amazing thing that we can do. T today, when we leave here today, we can go out and start talking about it. We've used this strategy in lots of other public health campaigns. You think about mad mothers against drunk driving. We've done that in terms of making sure that friends don't like friends drive drunk. We've asked for a bystander to get involved. Um, we made it very specific. You either take away their keys or offer them a ride. Um, in New York City after 9-11, um, there's a lot around security. If you see something, say something. We could use that slogan. We could use that for, for our work as well. It's a very complex issue, and there's no one right answer. Um, and there are many things, but there are many options, and there are many people who can respond over time. And we'll get back to that point in just a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what Joan said, one component of being an engaged bystander, or as we talked about it, bystander intervention, is just talking about it. Uh, several people talked about that tonight and touching on that, that we hope that when you leave here, that's not the end. That you go and you think about what was discussed tonight, you take some of the information that's on the back table, and you know you talk it over with your inner circle, with your family, with your kids. Um, if someone asks you at work tomorrow, hey, what'd you do last night? You can tell them. Um, just opening that dialogue up. Uh, and also, uh, it was mentioned earlier too about uh, having age-appropriate ongoing conversations with your family and your children about healthy sexual development and boundaries and what that looks like. Um, for the past three years, the NSVRC has focused on that specific topic through our efforts for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So on our website, there's a wealth of information there as well. So yeah, just being askable, that's the most important thing, talking about it. Because if people see that you are askable, they'll come to you, you can talk with them, you create that open dialogue. And then also too, if you're feeling uncomfortable by situations or you sense that there may be some red flags, Bring that up, and chances are, perhaps you're not the only one that feels that way. So having those conversations, you can get to, to the core of this. Maybe, maybe one, one thing actually that I think would um, br br brings that home to me very um, sort of is um, an offender that I was speaking to once, who, who talked about how he always admired the courage of his daughter, who he had sexually abused, because she actually had the courage to say the words when no one else would. And he talked about, he said, I'm not blaming his family. But he always wondered that if his family was able to talk about it in the first place, would, and he wouldn't have to say the words first, would it have been easier for him to, to actually disclose what was going on, and certainly would have made it easier for her daughter, for his daughter. So I think it's very important that that concept of actually saying the words and being the first ones to say the words and being comfortable, so that if someone does disclose abuse, that you're comfortable with, that, with those words, and you actually know what to do as well. So um, one exercise that we find really helpful to do, and, and I think it's, um, it's hard to do in this large room, so we're going to actually um, 
sort of run through it you know, between the two of us, but just to just give you a scenario, and then just how, it, if you actually drill down into it to any situation, and you can do that really with any situation, um, you, can, you can really unveil lots of different um, opportunities. So in a scenario here, Sam and Emily decide to head out to a football game at their high school. At first, they were having a great time, but then some guys behind them started to make some comments. At first, it wasn't too bad, then it started to escalate, and Sam and Emily tried to ignore them, um, but the guys became ruder. Um, the guys were saying things like, come sit with us, baby, you know, come sit on my lap, and it got more and more um, graphic after that. So Sam and Emily told them to stop, but it just seemed to encourage them more. So this, this is something, think about this being, you know, experience that you may have had, experience that your, your, your daughter or someone you know or sister, um, what would you do? What would you suggest that they do? So we just thought that we could just really unpack this a little bit for you. Um, and it's something, again, which is great to do if you ever work in a workshop to actually take any situation, you all probably can name hundreds of them, what would you do in that situation? So I think we'll start with you. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you start to see the ripple effects that no one is an island. So in this case, some individual things that we talked about, for instance, Sam and Emily, they could um, tell the people that are harassing them, hey, look, stop, and if you don't do it, I'm going to report you. Um, also, too, there are other people around them, so perhaps there's a row of fans in front of them that they could just tap on the shoulder and say, hey, do you mind if we switch seats? Um, so just, going, so just expanding the, the ripples out a little bit further. Um, so what about the friends of the, the, the guys who are harassing? Um, they could say, hey, this is really not OK. Um, um, this is not funny anymore. Um, they, could, they could actually go and sit down um, with Sam and Emily and say, you know, this is a, a no harassment zone. Um, they, could switch, they, could, they could find someone to help switch seats with them. Um, or they could sort of reach out and maybe um, you know, call some other friends outside or call security, uh, depending on what kind of situation um, or administration um, that they have there. And then chances are, if it's a school event, there's probably going to be other teachers there, coaches, parents, possibly school administrators, too, that are hearing this as well. And they could intercede. Um, Sam and Emily could actually go, maybe act like they're going to get a drink at the concession stand, alert security. Security could come back. And they could tell the people that are harassing them, listen, this isn't the place for that. Uh, we're not going to tolerate it and ask them to leave. And then as a follow-up, uh, bring it to school that next Monday and have like the teachers address the situation with the harassing students, have the principal reprimand those kids, and just letting them know that you know, the school and the school property is not the place for this. And I think that that's actually a place where a lot of people get stuck. Um, what they find is they think about just that particular moment, what could I have done, and I wish I had done, as opposed to, um, and maybe because I live in a small town, and if you don't do something in one day, you're going to see them at the supermarket. If it's not the supermarket, you'll see it at your kid's soccer game. Um, that Monday is sometimes actually the better, more teachable moment. It allows you to actually to not just talk to those two kids, but everybody else in that, on that stadium saw what was going on. So it becomes a teachable moment for that entire school. And you begin to ask questions, is there a school policy? Is there a code of conduct? Is there something that can be done within that institution to help make sure, and as people were talking about earlier, to create that social norm? So then we're talking about where do we begin. Um, we mentioned earlier being askable, talking about this, but not only talking about it, but listening too. If you are askable, people are going to come to you and they're going to bring this up and talk to you. So just listening to them, listening to not only um, the verbal comments, but the nonverbal cues. Like for instance, um, say you're at work and you notice a coworker really sexually harassing an intern, saying wildly, rudely inappropriate things to them. The intern is very uncomfortable about it. You're uncomfortable about it. But you know the intern might feel afraid to speak up, so they don't. So you are in the position where you could actually say something. And you could either talk to your coworker and say, listen, that's not acceptable. Or you could talk to their supervisor, talk to someone in human resources. So it's just seeing these um, daily things unfold and intercepting them before additional problematic behaviors occur. I think you have the next one, too. So then to help you through all of that, um, we talked earlier about learning about healthy sexual development. Like I mentioned, uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center has a wealth of information on our website. 
and it's free, it's downloadable. We also house the um, nation's largest library regarding sexual violence and prevention. So I, I invite you to check out our website at www.nsvrc.org. Um, in addition to the healthy sexuality materials that I mentioned that are online, uh, we also have some materials on the back table. Uh, Joan mentioned that she did a book a couple years ago on bystander intervention. And in that, there are scenarios and responses, as well as last fall, we um, released an information packet. And part of that information packet contains a bulletin. And in that bulletin, there are real life scenarios, just like the one we talked about with your coworker, um, and then Sam and, Sam and Emily, and um, it gives you practical responses. Um, so there are information available to you to help you. And then also just knowing, you know, being available, being willing and able to intervene, and then knowing another component of bystander intervention is if it's not safe for you to intervene, it's okay to enlist help from others. So it's okay to call for backup, so to speak. So we can talk a lot about what, what, you, know, what you can do, but I think it's equally important for us to talk about what we can do. And um, that, that's, that's a part which actually I think in, um, right now is just emerging in the media. I think Penn State was a real um, shift, even though a lot of what was happening in the Catholic Church was going on, especially I live around Boston, that was obviously very big in the news for us. But it really with Penn State, so it was really what the institution's responsibility is. Um, so you think about when you go back to your communities, um, you, you may be involved, um, if you have kids with a sports league or little league, or um, maybe involved with a Y. Um, in your communities, you might be involved in a faith community, or you may have a very strong neighborhood um, connection. But you can make a difference in terms of setting a, a new uh, social norm about how to behave. Um, simply by um, going to the bus stop. And um, when, when somebody brings this, you know, the picture of the sex offender just moved down the street and everybody in our bus stop should know about this, it's a great opportunity to begin to talk about that and say, how do we as a neighborhood respond? Um, so going back um, to an organization and thinking about, what are the, asking them, for example, what are the screening policies that, um, that the organization may have? Um, do you have a code of conduct? What kind of training do you give around the code of conduct? And then how do you, how do you um, enforce that? And um, actually, it was actually Marcus Aruba who's standing here, who um, I heard a talk a, while, a couple of years ago, who mentioned offhand that they had been talking to some offenders. And um, one offender at least had talked about how he had sexually abused within one organization, and then not abused in the next organization, and abused again. And asked, what was different about that second organization? And I've had a chance to talk to a number of other offenders about that as well. And they say that it wasn't safe for them to abuse in that second organization. That second organization had created some social norms. Um, to make sure that, that, in fact, that they knew that if they started to stretch the, um, how they interacted with kids, that, um, that the supervisor would say, oh, I'm not sure if you were familiar with their policy, but you're not allowed to actually close the door. You're not allowed to take the, your, this child um, home on your own. They realized it wasn't safe for them to abuse. So you can create, that's a very, I think, very vivid way of saying that you can create those kinds of social norms. Um, there's a wonderful um, report that, um, that you, is free that was done by the CDC um, about 10 years ago. And um, you can get this online if you just um, Google uh, preventing child sexual abuse within youth serving organizations. If you just do CDC, Center for Disease Control, youth serving organizations, this will pop up. Um, it's a great resource that gives you very concrete examples about what you can do. Um, there's also, I just want to mention, especially since he's in the back of the room and he tends to embarrass me all the time, um, Keith Kaufman is in, the, <laughs> is in the back and is doing some wonderful um, research around situational prevention. Um, and really looking at, really seeing some, um, some, um, some, I think, really incredible results that, that show that actually when an organization invests in prevention, that their, um, their organization is safer. It, and as I think the, the offender said, it's not safe for people to, um, to abuse there. So um, I think one of the things is that these are very, in some ways, it's, I mean, it sounds almost um, overwhelming, but some of these are very simple things that you can do. Um, one of my favorite examples um, is uh, Steve Brown, who uh, works at Klingberg. And um, he created a very inexpensive video just with a webcam and he, you know, that everybody who applies for a job at Klingberg has to watch. And it's this great thing about how great Klingberg is and how they care deeply about kids. These are at-risk kids and how, how important attachment and connection is. And then about 30 seconds before the end, he goes, however, and let me be perfectly frank here. He said, if you are here to harm in any, one of our children and sexually harm one of our children anyway, we ask that you do not apply for a job here. If you do apply, I want you to know that our organization will, will, will actually will prosecute to the full extent of the law. 
We ask that you withdraw your application and you seek help. It's very powerful, it takes 30 seconds and every applicant, it's a wonderful statement that, that it's a no cost statement that really says very clearly that this is an organization who understands what the sexual abuse is and will do everything in its power to make sure that, that the, the people in their care, the children in their care are um, being protected. So I wanna say please, you know, if you can take an active role, um, be the pebble that starts that ripple so we can keep that metaphor, keep going. Um, and just to say, it's okay to talk about this. Um, if you know that, um, if, and if you do feel comfortable talking about it, make sure you know what to do if someone comes and discloses to you. And help to create the social norms um, that you will respond to all behaviors, um, be it healthy behaviors, as we talked about earlier, unhealthy behaviors, or problematic behaviors, or, or abusive behaviors. So just in closing real quick, uh, we just ask you that you take what you learned tonight and use it in your daily lives. Be askable. We all have a role to play. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Joan or Tracy? Hmm? You can still ask it, Paige. <laughs> So I'm a mom, and um, I'm a filmmaker with my crew here, and I have a really big mouth, so I have no problem <laughs> standing up for things that I think are wrong. But I went to a school in the South where um, many boys were molested by a beloved coach. And what I can't figure out is why nobody stood up for us. Nobody stood up for all the children who were victimized or just in the realm of victimization. I think this idea of bystander intervention is incredible. I think it's important. But why do people tend to not do this? Why, I'm curious, why don't people stand up for children? And why, do we, and why do we, in essence, serve our children on platters to these people when doing that? I think a little bit of it is people don't know what to do. Um, uh, last March, I um, was in the courtroom for the Steubenville, Ohio rape trial. And that was where two football students were found delinquent for, for raping a 16-year-old um, girl. And many of their peers took the stand and gave their testimony. And they said, you know what, something I, I witnessed there, I knew it wasn't right, but I just didn't know what to do. People are afraid to speak out. Um, you know, so through that, in their own words, they were like, they knew something was wrong, they didn't know what to do. Um, so it was mentioned earlier, too, that we need, to, we need to get to the young people, and we need to talk to them and have, you know, honest, honest conversations about boundaries and respect and consent and what that all looks like. Um, and then, too, like with the Jerry Sandusky case, uh, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center was very active in that as well. And we teamed up with um, the State Sexual Assault Coalition to cover that as well, and I was in the courtroom for that. And I think there's just, um, there's still some disbelief. People don't trust their guts. Um, several people took the stand and they testified that oh, it's Jerry Sandusky. He did so many good things for our community. He has a charity, for crying out loud, for disadvantaged children. He could never do this. Um, there was a coach at the school uh, that walked in um, on him and another student, and he even said, you know, I left that night, and, I, and it just didn't seem right, but as I was driving home, I just kind of brushed it off as, no, it's Jerry Sandusky. He would never do that. So there's definitely a need for education there. Joan, do you want to? Yeah, um, I also say I think things have changed, um, and things are changing in a really dramatic way. Um, I mean, the best, best example I can say is that um, I work um, part time with a, a small press, near, um, and one of the things I wanted to do was have a, uh, it was a book for a workbook for girls who um, and um, who had been sexually abused, and I wanted to have a young voice reading a book as a sample, and so I had my daughter do it. So it was on her computer. She read it for me. I took a part that wasn't very graphic. Then one of her friends came over and they were playing on Facebook on the computer um, and she saw this, this text. And so she just turned, this, um, the seventh grade just turned to the other, you know, one seventh grader talking to the seventh grader, like, wow, were you sexually abused? I mean, the, 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 the fact that we're talking about this is in the media, the conversations are really changing. Um, and I think that we really have an opportunity here to build on those conversations in a way that we didn't have um, 10 years ago, we didn't have 20 years ago for sure. Um, when, I, when I was in college, you know, they, they actually, my professor said um, in basic psychology that child sexual abuse is the last taboo, it doesn't happen. 
I, I can't imagine what that felt like for every, every person in that room who had been sexually abused. So we have begun to shift that, so the cultural norm. We have to shift it much further. Um, but those opportunities um, exist, and I think that people are taking advantage of them more and more. And we can, we can lead the way there. Um, we are seeing that the tide is turning slowly, but we're very, very hopeful. Are there other questions for? Thank you for your question. Great question. We're going to do a handoff in the middle of the room. <laughs> what do you think is the role of general sex education in the prevention of sexual offending? With an emphasis on the do's and the do and the don'ts. What? Do I do first? I, mean, I think probably. Well, um, well and I think first of all, I think that you know the um, that there was um, very few um, evidence-based programs um, that uh, um, have shown around prevention that really have demonstrated to have an effect. And one of them is a program called Safe Dates um, that the CDC has evaluated. Um, Basically, what it has shown is that when kids can talk about um, and, and around sexual, around um, healthy relationships, when they talk about sexual relationships, when they can actually have those conversations, and they have those conversations at an early age, it can make a huge difference um, in their trajectory. So we often start thinking about what needs to happen on college campuses today, and absolutely those conversations are important. But we need to begin those conversations um, when they're younger, and when. I often get the, the question, like, when you do start talking about child sexual abuse with your child, um, I would say you talk about when they're born. You start using the proper name for body parts. Um, that begins the conversation. It gives a language um, to what, at least in my generation, was unspeakable. Um, so if we can talk about healthy sexuality, we can also then begin to talk about what's problematic and then what's, um, and, and then what's abusive. And uh, I often use in my workshops to talk about uh, uh, green light behaviors, yellow light behaviors, and red light behaviors. And if we start waiting until we see abuse, the red light behaviors, we'll never have the conversation. So we need to learn how to talk about the green light behaviors so we can begin to say, that's stretching into yellow light, um, so that we can actually have those conversations before any child is harmed, before anybody is harmed in the family. Do you want to add to that? Or? OK. <laughs> any other questions? Um, hi, I'm one of the filmmakers. Uh, so private institutions are somewhat self-regulated with regards to child sex abuse prevention and complicity. How can the Department of Justice and the government help to change laws for a national standard of care? Oh. <laughs> That's an easy one to try That's and answer. A great question. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, I feel like uh, um, there's like so many people in the room who would have great answers to that. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll just you know, to start. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I think that you know that what uh, President Obama is doing by bringing, you know, by using his uh, position as President of the United States to bring the conversation forward, um, is sort of one example um, of, of how our government can make a huge difference. Um, I think the fact that we are not um, investing in prevention, as uh, James, I think, really, as, as Americans, as James really are, um, articulated so well. Um, we need to begin to start investing in prevention and make that um, as, as valid a choice um, as we are in terms of um, playing on people's fears, which is what I think really drives a lot of what um, is happening in the criminal justice system. Um, I, think that, I think that people are beginning to see that you can't arrest. Um, just as I think um, I couldn't think of a better metaphor than I think what Tom, you did, um, in terms of breaking apart all the ways that we do. But I think that. Um, we went from, in, you know, in the 70s and 80s, from having really having no conversation, no awareness, um, to, to, to survivors starting to talk about sexual abuse. And at that point, there were federal government funding for programs in schools. But in the 90s, we started talking about offenders as well. And people's fears just ratcheted up. And it's almost like the pendulum swung, swung, swung the whole other, the opposite direction. Um, and I think that it's time as we begin to swing. And, and that's where we have all the punitive laws that Tom articulated so well. I think that people realize that you can't punish our ways out of the situation. We can't stop sexual violence um, through punishment. And it's a key piece of it. We can't throw away all those sticks. But it's time to move back towards the middle and start thinking about what we can do about investing in prevention. Um, we're not there yet, but I think that there are some opportunities that I'm hoping um, that the, the government, and particularly the Department of Justice, will begin to start taking advantage of. 
it was mentioned earlier how the majority of the media reports, they cover this topic in the criminal justice lens. So I think just, again, changing those cultural norms, um, working with reporters, because they kind of set the narrative. That's where people are getting their information from, is from the media. So if the media can expand it and not only talk about the crimes that are happening, but talk about prevention, talk about survivors, talk about services, um, talk about engaging bystanders. And I think what Joan said about the White House and their initiatives, it's turning, um, you know, slowly but surely. And they put us on last because we're optimists. <laughs> no, we put you on last because you're a voice of power. <laughs> Are there other questions for um, Joan and Tracy? Well, thank you very much. I think we'll conclude the event at this time. <laughs> We thank you very much for your attendance. Again, there's a number of resources in the back. Please take advantage of those. Um, thank you very much to all of our wonderful speakers, as well as our co-sponsors for the event, CalCASA, COSO, IVAT, and NSVRC. And have a wonderful evening, everyone.